The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals puts a hold on Joe Biden's vaccine mandate. A handful of congressional Republicans hand Democrats a win on infrastructure. And California rewrites how math should be taught. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stand up for your digital rights. Take action at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, here is your reminder. Black Friday isn't when you should start saving money. You should start saving money right now by switching over to Pure Talk USA because here's the thing. You're paying way too much for your cell phone bill. You could be cutting that thing in half if you switch over to Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you killer 5G coverage on one of the largest 5G networks in the country and still saves the average family over $800 a year. I made the switch. The coverage is excellent. Their US-based customer service actually cares about you and Pure Talk's prices are pretty much wholesale. We've got unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data for just 30 bucks a month. You can keep your number, keep your phone, or this month you can get Black Friday prices on new phones like the iPhone 12 for just 479 bucks, which is a major savings. They've got a 30-day risk-free guarantee. You really have nothing to lose. Now, you might think you need one of the big providers. You don't. They use one of the same cell phone coverage situations as the big cell phone coverage providers. So why not switch over to PureTalk at the same exact coverage as one of the big guys for half the price? Go to puretalk.com, shop for the plan and phone that's right for you. Enter promo code Shapiro. You'll save 50% off your first month and save on a new phone. That's puretalk.com, promo code Shapiro. PureTalk is simply smarter wireless. Some restrictions apply. See site for details. All righty. So Joe Biden is flailing. The man has a lot of trouble. Bill Beckbetter is basically dead on arrival. He just got shellacked in Virginia. He nearly lost the governorship of New Jersey for his party. He just came back from COP26, this giant global warming conference, with nothing, like with really nothing. And people mocking him openly at this point. The biggest story so far to emerge from COP26 involving Joe Biden comes courtesy of the UK Daily Mail, quote, he is supposed to be committed to reducing emissions. But when President Joe Biden produced a little natural gas of his own at the COP26 summit, it was audible enough to make the Duchess of Cornwall blush. An informed source has told the Mail on Sunday that Camilla was taken aback to hear Biden break wind as they made polite small talk at the Global Climate Change Gathering in Glasgow last week, which is always great. Fresh on the heels of rumors that he had literally crapped his pants in the Vatican. It was long and loud and impossible to ignore, <laughs> the source said. <laughs> Camilla hasn't stopped talking about it. The president met the Duchess during a reception on Monday at the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, attended by Prince Charles, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and Boris Johnson. Just hours earlier, the 78-year-old, nicknamed Sleepy Joe by Donald Trump, had appeared to doze off during the opening addresses, prompting more questions from his political rivals over his fitness for office. This is not the first time that Biden has faced claims that he broke wind publicly. In May 2020, Republicans, including Donald Trump Jr., posted a video clip of Biden containing a suspicious noise while live-streaming an exchange with Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf. However, a separate video, which circulated last month, and briefly trended on Twitter under Fartgate, was found to have been doctored to include fake flatulence. So, yeah, it's, it's always great when the big headline coming out of a global warming reduction conference is that you have emitted carbon from your ass. That's always, that's always a great look. And again, that, that is just, I think, writ small what this Biden administration is right now. The American people are unhappy with the Biden administration. They've done nothing of note on the foreign policy stage other than to make a bunch of weird noises over at this COP26 conference and then also surrender Afghanistan. Oh yeah, I forgot. Also, the USS Navy is now the US Navy is now commissioning the USS Harvey Milk because we need a navy ship. We need to name a navy ship after a gay rights activist who also in his life was pretty credibly having sex with underage guys. Definitely need a navy ship named after that. That's great. Meanwhile, the Chinese are developing like a thousand nuclear weapons. So, things are going great for the Biden administration. And and here's the thing. It doesn't seem like things are set to get better anytime soon for Joe Biden. In fact, last week, you saw that Joe Biden snapped at Peter Ducey from Fox News when Ducey read a Wall Street Journal report and pointed out that the Biden administration was reportedly going to give $450,000 to people who had crossed the border illegally and been separated from their families. And Biden just yelled at Peter Ducey. And then it turns out that he was wrong and his own administration had to walk it back. Well, then over the weekend, he snapped again at a Fox News reporter, this time snapping by saying, why wouldn't you want me to pay them? So remember, just a few hours earlier, he was like, How, why would you say that? No one's getting paid. And no one's getting paid. And now he's like, why would you be angry if, if we're paying people? What's wrong? With that? There we go. You said last week uh, that this report about uh, migrant families at the border getting payments uh, was garbage. No, I didn't uh, say that. Let's get it straight. You said... 
everybody coming across the border gets five hundred, four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So the number was what you had a problem. The number with. I was referring to. Okay. Now here's the thing. Sure. If in fact, because of the the outrageous behavior of the last administration, you coming across the border, whether it was legal or illegal, and you lost your child, nah. you lost your child. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. You deserve some kind of compensation, no matter what the circumstance. So now he's just as angry about people correctly reporting it as he was when he thought that they were misreporting it. He's very angry. If you lost a child. Okay, this isn't going well for Joe Biden. He's completely inauthentic. Nobody takes him seriously. He's literally farting on the world stage. He is leaving stinkers on the world stage. Even the media have now turned on him to a certain extent. ABC's Good Morning America did a report on the supply chain impact on normal families across the country. It didn't look great for Joe Biden. This year, like Charlie Brown's Thanksgiving, you may have to trim your list of trimmings. What kind of a Thanksgiving dinner is this? Where's the turkey, Chuck? Top turkey seller Butterball says it doesn't expect an overall gobbler shortage, but if you're hunting for a smaller bird, they could be tough to find. And it's not just the main dish at risk of running afoul. For your cranberry sides, Ocean Spray tells ABC it's committed to meeting customer demand, but experienced a variety of supply chain challenges. Okay, and so Joe Biden's response to this is to get super angry at everybody for pointing out the supply chain challenges, which again, have been exacerbated by bad union contracts at the ports, which have been facilitated by Democrats for decades, as well as the giant labor shortage that continues to hamper the economic recovery. By the way, There's some very good statistical evidence to demonstrate that the labor uptick that we saw last month was almost completely due to the fact that all of those benefits the federal government was providing people to stay home started to run out. And so people started to go back to work. The charts are very telling on that particular subject. So in a second, we'll get to Joe Biden's response to the supply chain crisis. And it's always just indignation, just indignation at being questioned. This is the thing about Joe Biden. He's always been this. I know that we were supposed to pretend that he was super empathetic and wonderful who's the kind of guy who's going to sniff your hair and rub your shoulders and make you feel better about yourself or alternatively just sniff your hair and rub your shoulders and make you feel creepy. But Joe Biden has always been the jerk who yells at you if you if you cross him. And he's always been the guy who, if, if you cross him, he says, well, fat, look fat. And he's always been that guy. We'll get to more of this from Joe Biden in just one second. First, let's talk about a podcast that you might want to give a listen to. I'm talking, of course, about the Jordan Harbinger Show. It's a podcast you really should give a try. I know every day somebody tells you you have to listen to some podcast or other. You mostly just blow it off, but you shouldn't blow it off. We are fans of Jordan Harbinger's show here at The Daily Wire. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest. And when I say there's something for everyone here, I mean that. I mean, he talks to people like hostage negotiators from the FBI or Kobe Bryant or Jack Schaefer. It's just something different and new pretty much every time. And even if you disagree with Jordan, you'll find something that you find interesting. Even though I don't always agree with Jordan, I'm not sure Jordan always agrees with Jordan, you'll find something fascinating and you'll learn something by listening to his show. We here at Daily Wire enjoy the show. You will too. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All righty, so Joe Biden, has a problem with supply chains, right? All the prices are going up. People are not going to get what they need in time for the holidays. Everything is taking a really long time to be delivered at this point. And so Joe Biden's solution to this is to yell at the reporters and the American people. It's it's they who don't understand. Don't you know? You don't understand. Ugh. He just kind of keels over. Here's Joe Biden. If we were all going out and having lunch together and I said, let's ask whoever the, whoever's in the next table, no matter how wh- what restaurant we're in, have, have them explain the supply chain to us. Think they understand what's, what we're talking about? All I can say is what I'm going to try to do is explain to the American people as best I can. And by the way, you all write for a living. I haven't seen any one of you explain the supply chain very well. No, no, I'm not being critical. I'm being deadly earnest. When your editor says explain the supply chain. OK. I'd love to hear Joe Biden explain the supply chain. And honestly, I'm not sure which end more hot air comes out of when it comes to Joe Biden. I really don't know. And he's just, I would love for him. Really, give us a disquisition on the supply chain, Joe. By the way, the media coverage on the supply chain hasn't been wrong. I've read the articles on the air from the Wall Street Journal in detail about the supply chain, from Scott Lincecum. I've read details about the supply chain. I've read you from National Review. I've read you from the New York Times. 
Joe Biden doesn't know anything about the supply chain because Joe Biden doesn't know anything about anything. And he, he's continuing, but you, the American people, are ignorant. You are ignorant. When you go to the grocery store and you're paying like 30% more than you were six months ago, that's because you're stupid. If you only understood, you'd know that Joe Biden is doing all the right things. The magic is happening. You're just too ignorant. And the reason you're too ignorant is not because Joe Biden is bad at his job. It's because the media, who pretty much spend every waking moment trying to clean up Joe Biden's mess, the one that he made in his bed every morning, the media whose job it is to be his night nurse, along with Jen Psaki and the White House press office, he's saying they don't do a good enough job. He's the one crapping the bed. It's just everybody else is doing a bad enough job or noticing that it stinks. And then Joe Biden was trying to brag about the economy on Friday. Again, all of this is just, you wonder why he's flailing? Because he's flailing, because he is who he is, and his administration is very bad at this. America's getting back to work. Our economy is starting to work for more Americans. Thanks to the economic plan we put through in Congress earlier this year and a successful vaccine deployment, America continues to add jobs at a record pace. In its historically uh, strong recovery, unemployment rate has fallen again today, down to 4.6 percent. This included a substantial drop in unemployment for Hispanics, which was much needed. Our economy is on the move. Okay, well, it would be a lot more on the move. You get the hell out of the way. And that means if you would stop with this vaccine mandate nonsense, because a lot of people are going to drop out of the workforce because, again, the vax mandate is going to force them to either vax or get fired come January 4th. And there are some testing provisions. Those could go away under a permanent OSHA rule. And so Joe Biden spent the, the same day that he was talking up the economic response, the same day he was talking up what a wonderful job he was doing on the supply chain. He was pushing forward a vaccine mandate that is, in fact, not popular. I'm sorry, it isn't. The polls show that 50% of Americans, this is the last poll that I saw, I think it was ABC News, 50% of Americans don't like the vax mandates. 47% of Americans do like the vax mandates. And of people who really, really dislike the vax mandates, it's like 41% really dislike the vax mandates as opposed to low 30s who really, really like the vax mandates. In other words, as, as this begins to hit home, and as people realize that they are not, in fact, if they are vaccinated, at risk from the unvaccinated, this is particularly true once this Pfizer pill comes out that's supposed to reduce hospitalization and death after a COVID diagnosis by somewhere upward of 90%. Then why exactly would they be listening to Joe Biden about the popularity of vaccine mandates? But he has to push it. So here he was pushing it. These requirements have broad public support. And they work. Already we've seen organizations that have adopted vaccination requirements increase their vaccination rates by more than 20 percentage points often as high as 90 per, over 90 percent. This is good for the workers, for their colleagues, for their loved ones, and for their communities. And it's also good for the economy. Okay, I'm, I'm going to need some evidence on any of this stuff. Why is, it, why, why is it good for workers to be forced to take something that they don't want to take? Why is, it, why is that good for them? It may be his judgment that it's good for them. I may think that they should. But it seems to me that in a free country, you get to make that call, particularly if you're young and healthy. But the idea is that you don't get to make that call. This old doddering fool gets to make that call for you. Okay, well, there is a piece of good news here, and that is that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has now stayed the vaccine mandate in its entirety. According to WIBW, one day after Kansas joined six other states in a lawsuit in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals to stay the OSHA COVID-19 vaccine mandate, the Fifth Circuit stayed the Biden administration's move. So we here at Daily Wire, we did file a federal lawsuit with the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, so we are waiting on that. In the meantime, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued an order to stay the entire mandate. And the entirety of their stay was basically, this doesn't even look remotely constitutional. It's like a, it's like a page and a half order. It just says, quote, because the petitions give cause to believe there are grave statutory and constitutional issues with the mandate, the mandate is hereby stayed pending further action by this court. That's, that's literally the whole thing. They don't get into any details. They don't really explain it. They're just like, yeah, on the face of this, this thing is bullcrap and we are not going to stand for it. So, no, they are not popular. No, there is no evidence that they make a large scale difference. And no, they're not constitutional in all likelihood. So Joe Biden is on the ropes, right? And it gets worse for Joe Biden. Because Build Back Better is on the ropes as well. Remember, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema now have no interest in passing Build Back Better as it is currently constituted. The Democrats keep lying and saying that they have the support of all Democrats on Build Back Better. They do not have the support of Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, both of whom are from either red or purple states. And what exactly is the incentive structure for Manchin to vote for Build Back Better now, to give Joe Biden what he wants, especially when Joe Biden is playing all sorts of numeric games with the bill? The bill is not $1.75 trillion. It's not $1.85 trillion. It's more like $4 trillion because they play all of these little games 
where they set up a program that expires in a year, knowing that it won't expire in a year. Joe Manchin knows that. Kirsten Sinema knows that. And so Joe Biden, his signature piece of legislation is Build Back Better, and that is falling apart. Nancy Pelosi on Friday wanted to bring up Build Back Better for a vote in the House. She couldn't get the votes. The votes just didn't exist for it. So here is Nancy Pelosi pushing Build Back Better. She was literally getting laughed at in the room by Republicans. If you're talking about how we want to have immediate and enduring difference for the workers and families, creating jobs, securing middle class tax cuts, lowering costs for families and making the wealthiest pay their fair share, all the while contributing to reducing the national debt, making everyone pay their fair share. Did I hear a laugh over there? Did I hear a laugh from those who added $2 trillion in tax cuts for the richest people in America, 1%, 83% of it going to the top 1%. This is paid for and more than paid for. So people were laughing at her because she said it was going to contribute to lowering the deficit, which 100% it will not do. 100%. And people are laughing at her at the room. Now, you can't laugh at me. You guys raised the national debt by cutting cutting taxes. Okay, the spending never went down. That is true. You guys are raising the national debt by blowing out the spending to record levels. And you don't even have the votes inside your own caucus for it. We'll get to more of Joe Biden trying to strong arm Build Back Better into reality in just one second. First, if you are a business owner, it can be tough to hire top talent for your team, especially when you're competing with other businesses to find the right people. So how can you get that hiring edge that you need? ZipRecruiter will help you out. Their invite to apply feature lets you invite the best candidates to apply for your open roles. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. How does invite to apply work? Well, when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, you start getting the most qualified people sent to you very quickly. Then you can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply with one click. Next key marketing manager, Aaron Hartji, loves invite to apply. She says, quote, they get my job posting in front of the right people. I instantly see great candidates and I can invite them to apply to my job. In fact, according to ZipRecruiter's internal data, on average for 2020, jobs where employers use invite to apply get two and a half times more candidates, which helps make for a lot faster hiring process. Take it from Aaron, who says, quote, you can basically tell ZipRecruiter who you need, when you need it, and they deliver. See it for yourself. Just go to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Okay, so Joe Biden is trying to push Build Back Better as well. And he's doing so with class warfare nonsense that's going nowhere. So on Friday, he said, you know, the, the wealthy added value to the country, but they didn't build the country. No, it's government, apparently, according to Joe Biden, who built the country. The, the wealthy are, 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 are value added to the country, but they didn't build a country. Hard work and middle class folks are the ones that built this country. They're the ones that built the middle class. They're the ones that built the backbone of the country. And what I decided to do was I said we have to begin to build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Well, folks, that hadn't been the case. I'm so tired about trickle-down economic theory that I'm trickled out. He is trickled out. I mean, in a, in a wide variety of ways, things are trickling out of Joe Biden. It's unfortunate, but that sphincter is just not operating as it used to. You hit a certain age in life, and things begin to fall apart on you pretty fast. By the way, when he says stuff like the wealthy didn't build this country, let's just be clear about something. In the United States, the way that people become wealthy is by building the country. That is the way that you become wealthy in the United States. You generate products and services and goods that other people need. It's not as though there's a class of people called the wealthy and they build the country. The the, the notion that hereditary wealth is what drives the United States is not true. The vast majority of people who become wealthy in the United States did not start off wealthy. I mean, every wealthy person that I personally know did not start off wealthy, virtually all of them. That includes me. It includes my business partners, right? My, My business partners were dirt poor. So this notion that if you are wealthy now, you didn't help build the country, that it was, quote unquote, the middle class who built the country. There is no group of people who are called the middle class. You're not middle class your entire life. My parents went from being low income to middle income to high income to retiring, right? This is what happens over the course of most Americans' lives. That's what happens in a free country where there is income mobility. But Joe Biden is trying to push the notion that the federal government has got to spend ungodly amounts of money because somehow this is going to spur growth. Somehow this is going to do it. And it's failing. He just doesn't have support for any of this. He can't get the progressives together with the moderates in his own wing. He can't do it. He's having a tough time on Build Back Better. And uh, and reporters are asking him about it. They're saying to Joe Biden, you know, as we'll get to in a second, the Republicans are blowing this nearly as bad as Biden is because of course they are. Of course they are. But 
A reporter said to Biden over the weekend, you know, you're not going to have GOP votes for, for Build Back Better to get you over the finish line. So what exactly is your plan here? To get this first agenda item over the finish line, you need Republican votes. Sure. You are not going to have Republican votes, though, for your Build Back Better agenda. Isn't it doomed? I think what's going to happen is we're going to see what happens in the Senate and whether or not I need only Democratic votes, which is likely, which is the likely outcome. And the question is, can I get all of those votes? This is a process. And all along, you've told me I can't do any of it anyway. Yeah, yeah, everybody said uh, he is so obnoxious. Between his screaming at people about how upset he is about Trump and his weird gazing into camera and leaning forward all creepy, like he's living in a sewer and waiting for a small child to come and he's going to attract him with a balloon. I don't know, like, I don't know what's going on with Joe Biden, but that guy is, there's a reason why he's in the low 40s in terms of his approval rating. Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, he says pretty obvious at this point that every element of Joe Biden's agenda is a failure. This is correct, of course. Every element of his philosophy and policy has been a failure. And it's not my opinion. It's the opinion of the millions of people who just voted last Tuesday to send him a very clear message. But Nancy Pelosi and President Biden are tied together because two times he's come down to these chambers and asked people to vote for those failed policies. Okay, and, uh, and two times he failed. And then on Friday, they failed again with regard to Build Back Better because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are not on board with this. And Joe Biden continues to fail, right? And it's going to continue to drive failure across the board in 2022, which Democrats know and which they are extremely scared of. There's an article in the Washington Post today about Joe Biden's failures in rural areas, which are getting worse. Politico, similar article. There's an article in the New York Times today called Democrats Thought They Bottomed Out in Rural White America. It was not the bottom. Quote, the increasingly liberal politics of Virginia had been a sore spot for residents of this conservative town of 499 people nestled in the Allegheny Mountains. But this past week, as Republicans stormed to marquee victories, powered in part by turnout in rural areas like Bath County, local voters cheered. We got our Virginia back, said Elaine Neff, a 61-year-old resident. We haven't had a win in a long time. Neff said she cried from a mix of happiness and relief after the election. She doesn't want to take the COVID vaccine. She believes Glenn Youngkin will relax state mandates. Outside a nearby grocery store, Charles Hamilton taunted the Democrats. He said, we're a county of old country folk who want to do what they want. They found out the hard way. In the jigsaw puzzle that is electoral politics, Democrats have often focused their energy on swingy suburbs and voter-rich cities, content to mostly ignore many white rural communities that lean conservative. The belief was, in part, that the party had already bottomed out there, especially during the Trump era. Virginia, however, is proof. It can get worse. In 2008, there were only small, four small Virginia counties where Republicans won 70% or more of the vote in that year's presidential race. Nowhere was the party above 75%. This year, Youngkin was above 70% in 45 counties. 45. So there's four in 2008. This year, Youngkin was above 70% 70 in 45 counties and above 80% in 15 of them. Steve Bullock, former Democratic governor of Montana, said, look at some of these rural counties in Virginia as a wake-up call. Folks don't feel like we're offering them anything or hearing or listening to them. This is, of course, correct. The Democrats have abandoned the rural areas. They've abandoned the non-college educated white vote. And the American people are fighting back against that because there's still a huge number of Americans who are white and non-college educated. And those people are voting increasingly for the Republicans. But it's not just that. The suburbs turned against Terry McAuliffe in Virginia. In New Jersey, it was not about critical race theory. In, Virgi in New Jersey, it was just about complete disapproval for Joe Biden's agenda. And the more Democrats pursue woke nonsense, the worse it's going to get for them. It's not going to pay off for them. So Joe Biden is in serious trouble, right? Joe Biden is flailing. Joe Biden is falling apart. Well, there's only one thing that Joe Biden can count on, and that is for the Republicans to be just as stupid as he is. And fortunately, he found some. We'll get to that in just one second. First, let us talk about how you keep your home safe and secure. This holiday season, deck the halls, walls, windows, and doors with the best deals of the year on the award-winning Ring Alarm. I'm sure we all know about the Ring Video Doorbell by now, but did you know that Ring makes an award-winning alarm as well? Ring Alarm is a powerful, affordable whole home security system you can easily install yourself. Whether you're running across town or across the country this busy season, you and your loved ones can rest easy knowing your home is protected. And it's more than just security. Ring Alarm protects your home from flood, freeze, and fire as well. Plus, it's way cheaper than those other companies. For what they charge for one month, you can get an entire year of Ring Alarm with professional monitoring. Right now, for the best deals of the year on Ring Alarm, go to ring.com forward slash Ben. This holiday season, make sure that you deck those halls, walls, windows, and doors with the best deals of the year on Ring Alarm. Again, I rely on Ring Alarm. Every time I go out of town, I want to keep track of what's going on on my property. I count on Ring Alarm to make that happen. Not just that. Even when I'm home, I got to keep track of my kids because they're totally wild and one will disappear. And I'm like, uh-oh, where'd the baby go? 
Pop up that Ring app. Now I know. Go to ring.com forward slash Ben to get a great deal on a Ring Alarm security kit today. That is ring.com forward slash Ben. Again, ring.com forward slash Ben. Okay, so with Joe Biden flailing, you would imagine that Republicans would just let him flail, would you not? That, of course, would be the smart move. However, you can always count on Republicans to be as stupid as humanly possible, at least a small percentage of them. Because late on Friday, the House of Representatives passed a roughly $1 trillion Public Works bill sending to President Biden's desk a generational investment in roads, bridges, and rail that had languished for several months as Democrats feuded over the terms of its approval. Now, you'll remember that this thing has already passed the Senate and that Mitt Romney had voted for it and that Susan Collins had voted for it and Rob Portman in Ohio had voted for it. And then Joe Biden didn't want the House to only vote on it. Right? Joe Biden wanted to tie that together with Build Back Better. The idea being that if Manchin and Cinema wanted their bipartisan infrastructure plan passed, they would also have to vote in favor of Build Back Better. Then it turned out that Manchin and Cinema weren't going to budge. And then Biden was stuck in a pickle because the progressives said, we will not vote for bipartisan infrastructure unless we get a vote from Manchin and Cinema on Build Back Better. Right? Pramila Jayapal had led that way as well. Well, late last week, Pramila Jayapal basically caved on it. Pramila Jayapal was like, okay, fine. You know what? We know that we're not going to be able to hold up the bipartisan infrastructure plan to get Manchin and Cinema to cave. So we do want that bipartisan infrastructure plan passed. So we will vote in favor of it with like a basic proviso that maybe we'll get a vote on Build Back Better sometime down the road. And so on Friday, a statement came out from the moderate wing of the Democratic Party saying they will commit to voting for the Build Back Better Act in its current form other than technical changes. They still want the cost from the CBO. By the week of November 15th, they say they will resolve any discrepancies that come up in the interim to get it passed. But that doesn't matter because, again, Manchin and Cinema are the ones who actually matter in this particular conversation. But then Pramila Jayapal put out a statement saying, quote, tonight, members of the Progressive Caucus and our colleagues in the Democratic Caucus reached an agreement to advance both pieces of President Biden's legislative agenda. Our colleagues have committed to voting for the transformative Build Back Better Act as currently written no later than the week of November 15th. All of our colleagues have also committed to voting tonight on the rule to move the Build Back Better Act forward to codify this promise. The president has affirmed these members gave him the same commitment. Okay, but there was one problem left. Because he had the progressives and the moderates saying, we'll vote for some rule to exp- to push forward Build Back Better, even though we know it's probably going to die a horrible, painful death in the Senate. And we'll vote in favor of bipartisan infrastructure. There's one problem. You still had six outstanding Democrats, namely the squad and their adjunct members, who were voting against bipartisan infrastructure. Democrats could only afford to lose three votes and still pass bipartisan infrastructure in the House. Right, so they've lost six, which means they didn't have the votes for either Build Back Better or for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act because they lacked the votes for bipartisan infrastructure in the House and they didn't have the votes for Build Back Better in the Senate. So this is the point where if you're a Republican, you stand there and you let them flail. You just let them flail, right? Because why would you hand them a win? Well, the answer is because Republicans, at least 13 of them, are just complete morons. And or they are so eager to slap their own party in the face that they voted against the rest of their Republican colleagues in order to vote for this infrastructure plan, which again is a giant boondoggle. It is $1.2 trillion of spending that are unnecessary. The vast majority of infrastructure spending that needs to be done is supposed to be done at the state level. The notion that America's infrastructure is completely failing, all of our bridges and roads are falling apart, it's not true. In my most nonpartisan studies, the United States' infrastructure is in the main okay. And if you want to upgrade it, that is something that can be done at the state level. There's no reason why Florida should be paying for New York's infrastructure problems. Okay, but nonetheless, you had 13 Republicans who then voted in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure bill and handed the flailing Joe Biden, a falling apart Joe Biden, a win. Which is just garbage. It's just garbage. At Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, he says, yeah, there's no question that Republicans bailed Nancy Pelosi out right here. How do you feel as a Republican about those 13 who voted for this? Well, Neil, you recall that I fought this very hard in the Senate. Um, it was very surprising to me to see 13 Republicans basically bail Nancy Pelosi out. She did not have the votes within her own party to do this. Uh, we had 13 Republicans that decided to step up and help her in this way. I think what they did was put themselves on a path to early retirement. And that is correct. Every person on the Republican side of the aisle, who voted in favor of the infrastructure plan should get primaried. Every single one of these people. They include some moderates, you know, people like Jeff Van Drew, who used to be a Democrat. By the way, how many members of, of, how many Republican members from New York alone voted for this thing? One, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. There are four from New York who voted for this, plus another two from New Jersey. So basically it's New York and New Jersey that voted in favor of this thing. 
Right? New York and New Jersey voted in favor of this thing, and everybody else was like, nope, we're not doing it. You had a couple of others. You had Don Young from Alaska. You had Fred Upton from Michigan. But every single member who voted for this thing on the right side of the aisle should be primary. You don't get to vote for Joe Biden's signature pieces of legislation at a time when we've already blown out the spending and when inflation is setting in. And when we already have a debt to GDP ratio higher than at any time since World War II, and then get to survive a primary challenge. That is not something that should happen inside the Republican Party. It's a disgrace. According to the Wall Street Journal, a major piece of Mr. Biden's economic agenda and his vision for making the U.S. more competitive internationally, its passage in the House hands him a bipartisan achievement that presidents of both parties have tried and failed to achieve for years. Again, remember, he had to do this with Republican votes. He could not accomplish it with just Democratic votes. So this is Republicans' fault. I know what House Speaker McCarthy had to do to make sure that those 13 Republicans didn't go along with Joe Biden here or if there was anything he could have done. But bottom line is, if you cannot whip your party hard enough to ensure that they don't vote for the other guy on a bill that has no interior support inside the Republican Party, I don't know what you are doing. His sagging poll numbers and Democrats' recent loss in the gubernatorial race in Virginia had pushed Democrats to muscle the legislation through the finish line this week, but the effort was circuitous and tortured for House Democrats, whose paper-thin majority repeatedly complicated leadership's plan for the legislation. Democrats had started Friday planning to approve the infrastructure bill after passing the rest of the party's priorities in a separate, roughly $2 trillion education, health care, and climate package. Progressive Democrats demanded the social spending legislation first receive a vote in the House, hoping to ensure that centrists would support it. That design then fell apart because centrist Democrats had said they needed more time to analyze the cost of the social spending bill. So then Pelosi just brought up the infrastructure bill and she didn't have the votes. She brought it up for a vote and she didn't have the votes. These 13 Republicans bailed out Nancy Pelosi. They bailed, him out. they bailed her out. It's unbelievable. And what exactly is the rationale for this? Seriously, where is the deep-seated Republican need to pass this thing? Okay, it's, just, it's just garbage and stupidity, and, and a lot of it is spite by some of these members. You'll notice a lot of names that voted for Trump's impeachment who are on that same list right there. I don't think that that's a coincidence. What a disaster area. This, of course, allowed Joe Biden to go out there and mock Trump and try to take a triumphant lap. Now, the, the triumph is not going to last for very long. Right? It really is not. Because the truth is the infrastructure bill is going to help virtually no one. And no one thinks it's going to help them. So it's just going to look like a big bag of spending. It's going to allow him to say that he did a uh, bipartisan thing, which is the only bipartisan thing that has happened throughout his entire administration. Right? I, again, I thought this was a bad move from the time that Republicans agreed to it. And I think that in the Senate, the math for Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and company was probably that if they got Manchin and Cinema on board with bipartisan infrastructure, that this would also get them to stand up against Build Back Better. So it was one or the other in the Senate. But in the House, it wasn't. In the House, the House Republicans could just say no. And that would have been the end of it. Then it would have been toast. It would have been done. Instead, they handed Biden a victory and he got, out, he got to go out there and, uh, and triumphantly make his uh, appeal to the American people. Infrastructure week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to say that infrastructure week. <laughs> uh, he's making fun of Trump, of course, because every week in Trump's administration was infrastructure week and infrastructure never really got done. And of course, he had to bring it's, it's hilarious how they've been stashing Kamala Harris away. And only when they do something that is camera friendly, do they sort of trot her out and then they just shove her right back wherever she came from. It's OK. You need to go back into that closet there and stay there, Kamala, until next time when we trot you out and pretend that you had something to do with with any of this. According to CNN. Both Biden and his cabinet officials are now going to go on an infrastructure tour, which is what Americans are up for. I mean, there's nothing that sounds like as much fun as an infrastructure tour. And it's, it sounds like, you know, just a great band or something. It's going to be awesome. Today, the president touted the bill at the White House and uh, CNN has now learned that Biden and his top cabinet officials plan to hit the road and tour the country in the coming weeks to promote the benefits of this bill. Oh, how exciting. They're going to run around the country talking about how much of your money they're now spending. By the way, what exactly is in the bill? It includes $110 billion in funding for roads, bridges, and major projects, as well as $39 billion to modernize and make public transit more accessible to the disabled and the elderly. Most of that is going to go to New York. And right? a huge chunk of that is going to go to New York City. So I'm glad that you get to pay for New York's subway system. That's exciting stuff. Also, you will notice that the price tag on this bipartisan infrastructure bill is something like $1.2 trillion. And yet, the bill is $110 billion for roads, bridges, and other major projects. When most people think of infrastructure, that is what they think of, right? That is not where most of the bill's money goes. The deal includes a $66 billion investment in rail maintenance, most of which will go to Amtrak. Ooh, Amtrak. So Joe Biden finally got to bail out 
his favorite train because that dude loves Amtrak and tells all sorts of lies about all the people he's met on Amtrak. And he, he, he treats his travel on Amtrak as some sort of actual presidential credential. The legislation will provide $11 billion in funding for highway and pedestrian safety programs. I don't know what that means. What is a pedestrian safety program? Telling people not to walk on freeways or what? A total of $7.5 billion will go to implementing a network of electric vehicle chargers. Because, again, it is not as though private companies have an incentive to ensure that there are EVs charging at their stations. Right? We actually need to have the state do it. Because if the state doesn't do it, then probably nobody will build it. Except for how there are EV chargers at pretty much every gas station now. But aside from that, another $7.5 billion will be used for zero emission or low emission buses and ferries. Ports and airports will be boosted with $42 billion in new spending. Also, they're going to put $65 billion toward broadband infrastructure and development. It'll include $73 billion to update and expand the power grid. How exactly are they going to pay for all of this? Well, they're going to have $200 billion in repurposed funds originally intended for coronavirus relief but left unused. So they're just taking all the money they were supposed to spend for COVID relief and they're going to dump it on this. About $50 billion will come from delaying a Trump-era rule on Medicare rebates. $50 billion from certain states returning unused unemployment insurance supplemental funds. Also, senators say they expect $30 billion to be generated from applying information reporting requirements for crypto. So they're going to tax crypto, essentially. Nearly $60 billion will come from the economic growth spurred by the spending. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Because so much economic growth is going to get spurred by wasting this amount of money. The uh, nonpartisan scorekeeper found the infrastructure bill would widen the federal budget deficit by about $256 billion over 10 years. So no, it's not going to be covered. How about human infrastructure? Well, they're still going to be pushing that in Build Back Better. So very exciting stuff. Okay, so again, Republicans hand Biden an imagistic victory here for no apparent reason. And uh, there should be blowback on all 13 members of the House who decided to vote in favor of, the, again, a giant spending monstrosity that was unnecessary in the first place. And that allows Joe Biden a victory lap at a time when his presidency is in a state of complete collapse. Political malpractice in the extreme. Okay, meanwhile, things continue to get bizarre and stupid in blue states. We'll get to California's new take on woke math in just one second. First, let's talk about a simple fact. You're paying too much for gas right now, right? We're all paying too much for gas right now. If you're in a blue state, you're definitely paying too much for gas right now. This is why you need Get Upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free GetUpside app in the App Store or Google Play right now, and you can use promo code Shapiro and get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill-up that's up to 50 cents cash back. Pretty solid deal right there. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free. Use promo code Shapiro to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your very first tank of gas. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to three hundred bucks a month in cash back. There is no catch. The cash back gets added directly to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app. Use promo code Shapiro to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your very first tank of gas. That is code Shapiro. Go check them out right now and go to the GetUpside app. Use promo code Shapiro. Get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your very first tank of gas. Everybody needs to save money on that gas right now. Get Upside helps you do it. Go download the app. Use promo code Shapiro for the special deal. All righty, we'll get to more in just one second. First, last week, as you know, Daily Wire announced we have filed a lawsuit against the federal government. It's an unprecedented move. Staring down the face of an increasingly authoritarian president leaves us with no other option. The Daily Wire's lawsuit was filed by the Dillon Law Group, Inc. and Alliance Defending Freedom in the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. The lawsuit alleges that the Biden administration lacks constitutional and statutory authority to issue the employer mandate and that the mandate failed to meet the requirements for issuing a rule taking effect immediately without the normal process of considering public comments, right? Which is exactly right. They're, they're saying it's emergency temporary standard, except for Biden announced it two months in advance, and then it doesn't take effect for two months, which is not the emergency temporary standard. So they've avoided comments, and also it's not an emergency. The mandate's unconstitutional. They're not going to stand for it. Our employees deserve to keep their medical history private, have autonomy over their own bodies, and honor any of their religious beliefs. We stand with their rights. We do with the rights of every single American. The Biden administration has warned that any companies that do not comply with this federal overreach could be fined as much as $136,000 per violation. So we need your help. If you're not a member yet, please consider joining us today. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Enter code do not comply at checkout. You'll receive 25% off your membership. Fight the unconstitutional mandate with us. We appreciate your help. We will not comply. As always, we have even more exciting news here at The Daily Wire. We are now launching Daily Wire Now, which means you'll be able to stream all your favorite Daily Wire shows on Vizio Smartcast. 
Tune in to watch Candace discuss current events with guests ranging from Donald Trump to Dana White or catch one of your favorite hosts. I know, listen, we're all talking about me. There's always something interesting to stream. Tune in to watch Daily Wire now exclusively on Vizio Watch Free Plus streaming app on channel 162 to access the content you love 24 hours a day, seven days a week, only on Vizio Smartcast. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Well, meanwhile, again, Republicans saving Democrats from themselves, it's the stupidest thing they can do because the fact is that on the cultural issues, Republicans are winning and they are winning big. This is why I actually think that even though a bunch of foolish and backward Republicans voted in favor of the infrastructure bill, I think it's going to have no long-term effects. I don't think the Democrats can save themselves. I think the Democrats are too tied in to an ideology that is completely at odds with how Americans think. I'm just going to give you an example of somebody who's very tied in to this ideology. That, of course, is Joy Reid who represents the hard left wing of the Democratic Party. So over the weekend, Joy Reid decided to rip on Winsome Sears again. And it's it's insane what people on the left think they can get away with re- with regard to, to speaking about race. It really is quite disgusting. And now this AR-15 wheeled in LG will be their new get out of racism free card. While Republicans nationwide make ban all history that shows any white person doing anything wrong to black people ever their 2022 mantra. It's just incredible. So according to Joy Reid, Winsome Sears, the new lieutenant governor elect of Virginia, is actually a just get out of racism free card for Republicans. Pretty impressive stuff there. And and unfortunately, this is how Democrats think. And most Americans are not into it because it has real effect on how people live. So the best example of this comes from my former state. I'm so glad I left of California. According to The New York Times, California tries to close the gap in math, but sets off a backlash. This is by J.C. Fortin. It's an unbelievable article. Quote, If everything had gone according to plan, California would have approved new guidelines this month for math education in public schools. But ever since a draft was open for public comment in February, the recommendations have set off a fierce debate over not only how to teach math, but also how to solve a problem more intractable than Fermat's last theorem, closing the racial and socioeconomic disparities in achievement that persist at every level of math education. Now, the reality is that if you want to look at the disparities that exist at every level of math education, you might have to start with family structure. You might have to start with the number of hours of homework that people are doing. You might have to start with the educational values of particular communities, which differ widely. And this is not a racial thing. There are Appalachian white communities where education is not valued until people underperform in schools. And there are Asian communities where education is highly valued until people overperform in schools. But according to California, the mere fact of disparity means that they seriously considered shifting how they're going to teach math. Now, math is, again, the it is the key component it is the key example, rather, of meritocracy at work. Now, honestly, the, the term meritocracy, I think, has been overused. And the reason I think that the term meritocracy has been overused is because when we say that meritocracy rewards merit, people tend to think of that as moral merit. Okay, in some cases, that's true, right? stick to grit, working hard. These are, in fact, merits that are rewarded by a free market system. But testing and, and objective standards, very often, they're not actually measuring, quote unquote, moral merit. They're measuring something else, right? They might be measuring IQ. They might be measuring how smart you are and your skill set and what you've learned and all of that. Okay, so when we say meritocracy, really what people should be saying is something like a skillsocracy, right? And and the good news about skillsocracies, right, about places where skills are rewarded is when people are rewarded for high levels of skill that has excellent externalities. If you construct a system where people's skills are rewarded rather than, say, their color, or rather than their, than their ethnicity, or their age, or their religion. What this means is that the activities of the people who are skilled generally tend to help other people. If you reward skill sets, then those skill sets, and, and, and those skill sets are awarded because the person with the skills can use those skill sets in order to do something for another person, right? This is how free market trades work. I have an excellent skill set. I use my skills to produce a product or good or service for you, and then you use your skill set to in turn enrich me. This is how free market trades work and consensual exchanges work. A skillsocracy is really good because it rewards people who have high levels of skill, which means that they are bettering the lives of all the people who they provide services, goods, and products to. It's the best form of distributing an elevated standard of living to more and more people. Most innovation happens at the top levels of the skillsocracy. People have higher skill levels, whether it's just purely in, in terms of innovation or whether it's in terms of being really good at their own jobs. That bleeds, that does bleed to everybody else because it raises the level of the products and services people are privy to. So you want a skillsocracy. Okay, the alternatives are completely randomized insanities like ethnocracies, 
where you get rewarded based on your skin color, or victimocracy, where you get rewarded or punished based on your group's history of being a victim or being an oppressor. And that has no good externalities. It doesn't help anybody. It makes things significantly worse because anything that is not a skillsocracy punishes skill. It makes skill a secondary factor. This is what California was seeking to do. So the California guidelines could overhaul the way many school districts approach math instruction. The draft rejected the idea of naturally gifted children, recommended against shifting certain students into accelerated courses in middle school, and tried to promote high-level math courses that could serve as alternatives to calculus, like data science or statistics. Okay, so first of all, if you reject the idea of naturally gifted children, it's because you're an idiot. Some kids are gifted, period, end of story. Some kids have higher IQs than others. And shock of shocks, it turns out that there is a heavy, heavy genetic component to that. That if both parents are neuroscientists, there's a good shot that their kid is going to have a higher IQ than somebody, both of whose parents are on welfare. Okay, that is just the... I'm not saying that's inevitably true. There are many smart people who are on welfare, I'm sure. They're not all that many stupid neuroscientists, but they're, I'm sure, smart people on welfare. But if you have to take the average person, and all you know about them is child of two neuroscientists versus child of two people on welfare in a free American society, and all you, and all you have to go on is that, whose kid do you think is going to have the higher IQ? Okay, so... To pretend that that doesn't exist in real life is stupid. It's just dumb. It's like saying that two, two tall parents are not likely to have a height-gifted child. Where, I mean, how could we possibly say that some people are more height-gifted than others? To pretend that intelligence isn't inborn at all, and we are all sort of tabula rasa, is silly. It's just not true by any available metric. Okay, but this is what California wanted to teach. They recommended against shifting students into accelerated courses because they want to punish skill sets. They want to defeat the skillsocracy. The last thing you want to do is reward people who are gifted, who, by the way, should use their gifts on behalf of society in a free market society. Free markets allow people to distribute the uses of their gifts widely. This is the magic of free markets. Everybody on the left thinks that free markets make you more selfish. That is untrue. Free markets mean that unless I give you something that you want, I starve. That's what a free market does. Socialism makes you more selfish because it assumes that I can sit here on my ass all day and you have to give me something for my trouble. So this is what California is pushing now. The battle over math comes at a time when education policy on issues including masks, testing, and teaching about racism has become entangled in bitter partisan debate. The Republican candidate for governor in Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, seized on those issues to help propel him to victory on Tuesday. Now Republicans are discussing how these education issues can help them in a midterm election next year. Even in heavily Democratic California, the draft guidelines encountered scathing criticism with charges that the framework would inject woke politics into a subject that is supposed to be practical and precise. Joe Bowler, professor of education at Stanford, said, quote, people will really go to battle for maths to stay the same. Even parents who hated maths in schools will argue to keep it the same for their kids. The battle over math pedagogy is a tale as old as multiplication tables. An idea called new math had its heyday in the 1960s. About a decade ago, many debates over the National Common Core standards broke out as well. Today, battles over the California guidelines are circling around a fundamental question. What or whom is math for? This is the stupidest question I've ever heard. The answer is math is for everyone because it helped everyone. And if you're not good at math, tough, math still exists. Testing results show regularly that math students in the United States are lagging behind those in other industrialized nations. Within the country, there's a persistent racial gap in achievement. According to data from the Civil Rights Office of the Education Department, Black students represented about 16% of high school students, but 8% of those enrolled in calculus during the 2015-2016 school years. White and Asian students were overrepresented in high-level courses. Critics of the draft said the authors would punish high achievers by limiting options for gifted programs. William, Williamson Evers, senior fellow at the Independent Institute, was one of the authors of the letter. He said, that's not right. He said, math is math. Two plus two equals four. And that, of course, is exactly right. But, the, but this is not what California is moving toward. California is, is moving toward the idea that everyone should be given an equal result even if they are not equally good at math. The, the, the detracking movement is an attempt to destroy the skillsocracy in favor of some other moral component that is brought by the left that has no basis in reality. So if California and the rest of the left wishes to pursue this, they're going to reap the world win. And I'm not sure that they can pull out of this tailspin. So yeah, it's bad that Republicans voted for the infrastructure plan. Every Republican who did should be punished for it. But in the end, the Democrats have embraced a suicidal strategy with regard to the American people who will not accept the substitution of any metric other than a skillsocracy. Because if they do, they've substituted bigotry for freedom.
Alrighty, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of content. In the meantime, go check out our newest podcast, Morning Wire. Today's episode is available right now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure to tune in. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Elliot Feld. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Bradford Carrington. Host producer, Justin Barber. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant, Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. John Bickley here, Daily Wire Editor-in-Chief. Wake up every morning with our new show, Morning Wire. On today's episode, a federal court halts Biden's employer vaccine mandate, the infrastructure bill finally passes, and a closer look at the electoral red wave. Join us and get the facts first on the news you need to know with our show, Morning Wire. Morning Wire. 